If you don't know it, Sam Weber and Dan Winters are taking the stage. We're very excited about this interview. Um, I'm sure you all know them, I, uh, but maybe you don't know them. So I'm not going to do any kind of biographical, but I just want to show you some images of, from each. Sam Weber will start with, this is the cover he did for American Illustration. And then he has, uh, I'm just showing some of the, their winning images in the current volumes. To give you an idea of who they are, Sam Weber's Hammer. Sam Weber's Lolita cover. Photos by Dan Winters, celebrated photographer and, as we're going to find out, an illustrator as well. A few samples, and Dan's going to show some more of his work through the interview. OK. Cool. Sam, I'll let you have it. Great. <laughs> it's nice to meet you, Dan. It uh, is, likewise. We had a very uh, very quick brief meeting just yeah. at the stairs there. <laughs> Three minutes yeah, before. Yeah, super, super weird. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, as Mark alluded to, one of the things I think that makes you so relevant to this venue and, and such an interesting individual is uh, the photography you do in relationship to the illustration that you make. Um, and I'm not sure, Mark, can we show some of the, yeah, the images? Or yeah, uh, does, does Dan have the clicker? Yes. Let me just get you set up to click. I'm just to give some people some, some context because obviously the, the photos are uh, ubiquitous. Um, and many of them I was familiar with. Uh, and the illustration work, some of it I'd seen, especially in Wired and, and places mm -hmm. like that, but right. uh, it never occurred to me that they were done by the same individual, which mm -hmm. uh, is fascinating. Well, you know, the, I did, I've done portraits for years, and it was one of those things that, uh, that was sort of a good staple bread and butter, but, um, you know, I always liked to illustrate, I always liked to draw, I loved to build things. So it became kind of a, you know, natural extension. So these are all sort of recent and older portraits. And then, uh, I guess several years ago, what happened was, uh, so here's, you know, illustration starts here, right? So this is a piece of The New Yorker where I was illustrating a fiction story on a altercation on a rooftop by which a, uh, a maintenance worker falls off the building, right? And so f illustrating that photographically required, you know, building a rooftop and getting a big airbag and building a 12-foot platform and getting an Olympic diver slash stuntman to, like, jump off of it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's technically it, it falls under illustration, right? But it's, you know, a photographic process, which is, which is you know, which I really enjoy. And some, some of these are the same. You know, this, is a, this was an uh, assignment to shoot a photo booth for Entertainment Weekly, and I couldn't find one I liked. So I built this one in my shop, life size. Was that was that really how the illustration process sort of began as a dissatisfaction with the the things that you had available to you to sh to shoot? Well, you know, using photography, we're dependent on subject, right? We're dependent on a physical object to point our camera at, right? So, extending p beyond photography, obviously, is way more liberating, as you know, because I mean, m at times, right, you have a blank canvas that way, and you can sort of like create whatever you want, and photographically, you know, it's got to be created in front of you for the most part. That's obviously changed quite a bit, but uh, not necessarily as much of a dissatisfaction, you know. Um, sometimes the logistics required that. In this case, yeah, you know, I went to there's place in, I live in Austin full time and there's a, uh, there's a chain of ice cream places there that have photo booths in them. So my f assistant and I went to the ice cream place, sat down, got ice cream, and then I brought a tape measure and I called out all the measurements for the photo booth and we just went back and, and built the thing. Um, and yeah, in this case certainly it was. It was, uh, it was a dissatisfaction. This was another one where we built this set to illustrate a certain point. It's for IBM, but the idea, you know, the campaign was called Deeper. So the idea that everything was sort of like moving into depth and, uh, you know, just from a logistics standpoint, like, you know, go get a location, have, you know, all that stuff or, you know, do a one day build and build this thing. So from a, it's pragmatic at times, you know, to do it, to work this way it's with photography. So on a, on a project like this, when, when you're being asked to, I guess, essentially illustrate something as abstract as the concept of going deeper, I'm assuming it was that was what they were they were after mm -hmm. sort of a mm -hmm. conceptual take on that. Are you are you concepting these images yourself? Are you yeah are you working um, in conjunction with the creative director? And this stuff I concepted all myself. Um, there are definitely major collaborations that I do as well. The deeper thing I just 
kept drawing. I did tons of sketches. And so then you're, you're actually drawing on paper to come up, come up with ideas. Yeah, what you mean absolutely. by sketches? Yeah. In fact, that's how some of the uh, you know the pencil. Uh, well, we're not there yet, but yeah. For example, this was a story for Wired that B and Bill Gates wrote the uh, this intro. Bill Gates wrote, and I illustrated his piece. And he was talking about a lot of the infrastructure difficulties in bringing many amenities, not amenities, but necessities to third world countries, one of which was water. And he touched on water quite a bit. And something as simple as water requires a huge infrastructure. So the idea was it was a one-two punch, sort of the opener was this glass with this kind of mechanical or mechanics in place providing this kind of water, which is, you know, represents to me like yeah. purity, et cetera. And then the turn page was, you know, the realization that there's a huge infrastructure that's informing that. So, you know, that's, this could have, these were drawings, the drawings looked pretty much identical to this. Um, when I started getting into, this is a story that illustrated the urinary tract, which is, all, <laughs> you know, I know, which is always, you know, those are all, always really interesting ones. But then we get into the drawing stuff. So this was a column uh, that I did for the New York Times for a year called Diagnosis. I, f I find the transition, by the way, just fascinating because the, the first piece, the, the New Yorker image that you showed, um, was I would I would almost classify that just as a photograph. Obviously, no, there, was, there was quite a bit of staging and things yeah, like that. And 100%. then as you're moving on to the uh, some of the more constructed things, the photo booth was sort of an interesting second step. And then by the time you're getting to the water piece and the piece about the the urinary tract, they're right. they're essentially sculptures that you're that you're photographing. One hundred percent. Yeah, I um, call them. You know, I just build a sculpture, photograph yeah. it, dismantle it. Were those sort of displayed in, in any kind of reasonable chronological order? Was that sort of how it happened? Photography slowly uh, moving towards illustration or were they kind of done at a, a different time? Well, period? it's interesting because a lot of the photography, like the Helen Mirren, for example. So I would call that, you know, photographic illustration to a degree because we're building that environment and then controlling all the aspects of the shoot to achieve sort of a picture that's been storyboarded. Um, the other portraits are much more fluid and organic. They take place on set. There's not really a preconception of it. Um, I think the building which led to sort of the physical illustration was a byproduct of dissatisfaction, like we talked about, with locations that were available within, you know, a 20-minute circle of Hollywood for two hours, you know, when you're shooting portraits, right? So start building environments that are very much, very much sort of illustrative environments. Um, and then that parlayed itself into kind of just creating, like, worlds and, you know, solving problems. I've talked to a lot of the people I work for, and they say, you know, we get something in our hands that we have no idea what to do with and, you know, can you make something of this kind of thing. So I imagine in a lot of ways that's what a, a creative director and art director is kind of coming to you period. for, right? Yeah, yeah, period. Yeah. yeah, I would say for sure. So these these are pencil drawings and uh, like I said, those were for The New Yorker. This was kind of an early one for me that uh, that sort of shifted me into works on paper type illustrations. This is a um, story for Discover and it was on gravity. And these were basically refined versions of tight sketches that I sent her. So oftentimes I'll do a really tight sketch and say I'm going to build this and that was intended on being a construction piece. And the direct, director of photography at the time, Maisie Todd, said, hey, can you just draw the drawings you sent me better and we'll just do drawings. And that was kind of an early shift, yeah. you know. Do you, are you at liberty in, in instances to basically sort of provide any solution that you're comfortable with or do you, do you feel that people come to you looking for a photograph, looking for a drawing, looking for a construction? Um, yeah, I'll discuss that in advance. And I do feel like because the website has so, <clears throat> so many versions of so many things, it's been a gift yeah. really to have that because we can go to a certain section and say, you know, we really like something along these lines. And then, of course, I can take that and interpret yeah. it, you know, and say, okay, we're going to do a pencil drawing. I have a general idea of, you know, what that looks like, you know, because it's materials dependent yeah. once again, you know. Do you, do you feel that having a diverse body of work like that has ever worked against you? Because that's something I hear a lot about, especially from... Uh, young artists, people who are just getting their careers started, you know, they seem overly concerned almost with, with showcasing too many different ways of working for fear of scaring people away or making people nervous. Yeah, I think that's a result of presentation. You know, I tell students oftentimes if there are multiple or myriad ways that you work in to really make a point when you show it to delineate between those bodies of work. And I think the, I think creative directors and the people we work with, photo editors, et cetera, art directors, um, I think they're, they're more likely to be scared or confused if it's intertwined. Because it, it seems like oftentimes when I've seen portfolios that are all over the place, they'll have three or four different ways of working, but they're smattered with throughout one another. That I feel like, you know, if you delineate, you know, this is my portrait section and maybe there's a pause in the portfolio. And then there's a section of this and a section of that. Then I think it's more 
succinct, and I think the I think the viewer of the portfolio can, reads it as this person works in several different ways, rather than this person doesn't have a defined vision. Sure, right. I guess the fear is that the, the person themselves does not understand the difference between the, the things that they make, and right, right, as right. long as you can clarify yeah. that to people. I mean, I'll see portfolios uh, that where there's some really bad color pictures in the portfolio, and then the caveat is that oh, you know, I just wanted to show people I could shoot color. Yeah, it's like well. Don't put it in there if it's not, you know, if sure, you're yeah. making excuses. I have an instructor one time that said it's either photo credit or photo blame, <laughs> which I always found amusing, very amusing. So then this stuff is all, you know, the pencil stuff. And uh, this is a pencil drawing I did for Wired uh, just a few months ago, I think. And once again, it was to illustrate a zero emissions coal plant in China. And this, I got schematics of the sort of the system and the way it worked and then kind of whimsical, kind of made a more whimsical approach. But, you know, these are, truthfully, these are, I mean, to a degree, like infographics at this point, right? They're kind of like describing a process. Where, where does the, the interest in science come from, Dan? Is that, is that just the type of work that you're being asked to make? Do you have an interest in science? Very much so. Yeah, yeah very, very much so. Aerospace, biological sciences specifically. Um, I studied entomology. I raised bees. So I have a very sort of deep interest in biological sciences. And then certainly physical sciences, aerospace, aircraft, et cetera. Do you mind if I ask when, when exactly the entomology studies, was that uh, uh, before you became a photographer? Or? Yeah, so um, when I s turned nine years old, I joined a 4-H club, which I grew up in an agricultural area in California, so it was very common. And, you know, 4-H is primarily based in, like, agricultural studies, woodworking, small engines, et cetera, mm -hmm. veterinary sciences. Uh, and entomology became a real passion of mine, and I studied it from the time I was nine till I was 18 um, and competed, you know, nationally um, in the science fair, protective response to the Eliotis beetle and all this kind of stuff that I, that I did. And uh, I started beekeeping at the same time when I was nine. And so the biological sciences were always very fascinating yeah. to me. I love stories like that, partially because I think it's not f fair to do this to everybody, but there's, you know, part of me that wants like the narrative of the childhood passion somehow filtering into the, mm -hmm. to the, you know, the final career at the end. And I, I know that doesn't always happen, but it, it's such a, it's such a great sort of thing to think that, you know, the interests of childhood can really be reflected in the, in the work of adulthood. There's a, that's absolutely true. I was just a part of a design conference uh, for Wired in uh, Marin County at Skywalker Ranch. And uh, I spoke on the second day, but I noticed that every speaker, almost without fail, um, talked about, oh yeah, when I was a kid, I started doing this. And when I got up, I thought, man, we need kids in here, you know, to hear that. Because so much of the sort of the passion that's expressed, you know, started early on. And I think when we start early on, we, ha we start to really understand our own dialogue, like our internal dialogue. You start to really understand how you think about things and to be mindful of what we, how we're reacting to things and understanding uh, um, sort of what our language is, you know. So, yeah, I feel like that's really important. Uh, you are a parent, correct me if I'm uh -huh, wrong? I'm 21-year-old studying aerospace. Shocker. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> totally. If anybody knows the amount of aerospace stuff I've shot, that yeah, it didn't fall too far from the tree. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, it's good stuff. That's great. Uh, was there any? Uh, there was no pressure to become an artist. I take it you were supportive. He, of it's the interesting. He's uh, yeah, one hundred percent. In fact, he compliments and 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 thanks me often for fostering every interest he's he had as he grew up. Whether it was like learning every flag of every country. In the, we were at the uh, NASA Media Center uh, when I was working on the shuttle launch project. And uh, the Media Center, the entire ceiling is flags hang hanging vertically from all over the world. And Dylan stood there and he missed one. He just started going like, you know, boom, 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 all the way down the line. And the one he missed, he corrected himself. He's like, oh, no, wait. I think that's, that's, yeah, that's not the Serbian flag. That's the, you know, whatever it was, you know, the, yeah, I don't know, the Imperial German flag or whatever it was, you know, even like periods, you know, he was good at. So anyway, um, but his, his interest in art, actually he's talented musically, but he's a mathematical mind. And he, he told me at one point that art, he didn't like art because art didn't have an answer. And in mathematics, there was an answer. There was a way to solve the problem. <laughs> and he said, when I'm doing art at what? school, there's no I know, answer. there's no answer. Well, you know, he's doing art at school, and he says it frustrates him because he doesn't know when he's done with it, eh? and that he doesn't know where it's going to go. But I told him, you know, the more you do it, obviously, right, the more c you can calculate your results yeah. and you understand where you're going to end in up. In theory, yeah. But isn't that funny? Uh, I know in theory, yeah, totally right. That right. is funny. Well, your, yeah. your kid is really bright by the sound he's of it. He's a bright kid, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, this is some collage slash painting stuff I did for Wired. Um, and, and, you know, I think when this stuff's prominently featured, you know, you talk about, you know, magazines that have more of a, 
sort of a presence or an audience, you know, I think the, you know, the New York Times stuff and the Wired stuff and the New Yorker stuff, you know, they kind of all inform to a degree one another, you know, those are kind of in the same world. Sure, yeah, and especially when you're talking about the, the visual culture of those, those institutions. 100%. You know, those yeah. art departments are, I guess Wired is in San Francisco, but... Mm -hmm. You know, that's, it is part of the community, especially here, sure. the publication community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the one thing, you know, I, when I was uh, early on in my career, I found really helpful and would highly recommend it to anyone that's looking to sort of change what they're doing or change their venue is to, I would go to magazine stands because I have a passion. I started as a photojournalist, passion for magazines, passion for publications in general, books, et cetera. But um, to go to a stand and just start rifling through the thousands of, you know, thousand magazines yeah. or a newsstand and figure out where you could live. Yeah. And rather than square peg and round hole, it's like, my God, you know, my work could be featured in this magazine yeah. with no problem and then kind of pursuing that rather than, you know, kind of more strategic bombing rather than saturation. Bombing. Yeah, and I've noticed um, a, a blind spot regarding that exact uh, skill amongst uh, my students, for instance, because they're consuming so much imagery online, and it's completely divorced of any sort of context, so mm -hmm. they don't understand that this was in a, a magazine that is news-based, and this isn't a magazine that's sure. entertainment-based, and so, um, I don't know, they're, they're clearly getting other things from, from looking at images online, but... Mm -hmm. um, it seems like there, there's a danger, right, to, to, to looking at images without any kind of context. Yeah, the interesting thing about context for me is that if there isn't a context presented with the image, we kind of make up our own story. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. you know, I remember early early on seeing the uh, wonderful 1932 Cartier-Bresson photograph behind the guard of San Lazar, where the man is playfully sort of jumping into a puddle, and it's the moment before his heel breaks the surface tension in the water and being incredibly frustrated you know wanting to know like how that was made how was that made did was that set up did he know the guy you know it was so frustrating to me because I was trying to make up a story and really to save my own frustration I decided at some point like it didn't really matter like it was what it was you know it in it's a beautiful image it's compelling it it, it was never um pegged, nor was it involved in any kind of like news. It was a completely like visual image. So I do feel like there is a danger, or not necessarily a danger, but I do feel like when it's a news image and it's telling a certain story, at least the initial usage or usage that is is around what that what that uh, that news event is, that it be presented with the image, you know. But just purely as like to appreciate an image singularly, you know, context oftentimes is is really not necessary, I think, yeah. oftentimes uh, important, though. That's super interesting. I actually, um, just to bring it back to, to your work momentarily, um, you know, when you are making an image, how, how service-oriented are you when you're working on something? Are you, are you trying to create beautiful things to satisfy yourself, or mm -hmm. are you, yeah. do you, do you feel beholden to the client to please them? You know, there, I, there's, I, I say this only because that seems to be a reoccurring discussion between my friends and I about, you know, how much do you please yourself? How much do you please the client? Mm -hmm. And when push comes to shove, what side of the of the divide do you fall on? Well, I, you know, I, I, I came to realize that I had a skill set, like within photography, for example. Like I possessed a skill set that would provide me with opportunities because I possessed that skill set. You know, that skill set's changed over the years, obviously. But, uh, you know, I, I will say that for the most part, particularly in editorial context, is that... Um, I don't get a whole lot of direction, and therefore, I feel like it, the onus falls on me to st step up. And so, oftentimes, yeah, I'm trying to please myself. But I know through that, I know that there's been enough, dis enough discussion to where the client has an idea of what they're going to get, like some sort of loose idea, um, especially in illustration, obviously. I mean, I sketched, not this one, but I sketched the previous image um, fully fleshed out, and I did that because I needed to know what it was going to be. And so there was a complexity to that that I sketched out and got approval for it, but you know, there was no guidelines whatsoever about you know, how, to, how to execute it. But I do think, you know, in work in general, you know, it's got to be satisfying some days less than others, you know. Of course. I mean, you know, as an artist, you know, the last thing you want is to, like, lapse into formula. Although we do have a way of working. We do have a way of seeing things. We're dependent on materials, obviously. You know, it's amazing as a photographer that nothing we use, we make for the most part. Everything is something. So what we're doing is we're taking a bunch of technology that's out there and we're adapting it to sort of our vision or our way of thinking or our way of working. Um, but we're dependent completely on manufacturers. So I know I went kind of way off from no, the I, question. This is, this, is, this is great, though. I love this idea of talking about the mechanics and the tools. Yeah, I mean, even in what you talked about earlier, it's like, I'm going to do a pencil drawing of the torso of a woman who's fainted. 
you know, you have kind of an idea what that could look like, you know, and then I'll do a quick sketch and then go. But I don't think there was any sort of shock when, you know, you turn it in, you talk about what it's going to be yeah. in advance. But I do feel like, you know, I intentionally, without fail, every single time, with a few exemptions, uh, I, you know, I feel like I have to constantly rise to the occasion. And you also know as a freelancer, you know, you're only as good as your last record, right? Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, yeah, does yeah. someone like you still still think about stuff Total like 100%. that? Totally, 100%. Really? Every time. Yeah, I really do. And I think you have to. <laughs> I really think you have to. I think There's I no hope for any of us, you guys. I had this misconception, <laughs> this misconception early on that, like, if I, if I could shoot a Rolling Stone cover, like, everything would be great in my life. And then I shot a Rolling Stone cover, and then the next day I woke up and nothing had changed. And the, <laughs> and the idea that that was 20 five years ago. Well, that's, and, I guess, yeah. sort of reassuring and also sort of depressing to think that someone <laughs> with a career like yours still has insecurities. I don't know that it's an insecurity. It's more of a realization that, you know, ultimately we are able to express our passion through our work, but we have to understand the mechanics of who's uh, paying for it. And the mechanics of who's paying for it is a photo editor or, a, or you know, a photo editor or a director of photography that gives you the assignment, and they get the thing, right? And then they have to turn around and go to the, their subs or their superiors with that thing, and if that thing falls flat on its face, it's a reflection on their decisions and their their the, the decision making process they're making in which they receive that image, right? So it could be you know it it. it they don't want to have that conversation over and over. You know, you get a couple get out of jail free sure, cards. Yeah, you know, and sometimes yeah. you get on base, sometimes doubles, triples, home runs. But you know, the home runs are elusive. The triples are elusive. But you know, if we can get a solid double every time, and 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 you know, get a good RBI, I, I suppose. Oh boy. <laughs> to use a baseball yes, analogy. Can you make a I don't even dragons follow, analogy? I don't even I follow understand. sports. <laughs> I didn't know who won the World Series until after it was over. But I played baseball for years, and I find that those analogies, that specifically baseball. Uh, and all badminton as well. There, there's a lot of good analogies. There are none in badminton that I know of, actually. <laughs> 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 Other than it's just, there's just an amazing sort of banal sort of event going on. So, so how much of your success, Dan, do you think is attributed to your personality? Because it sounds like you have, you have a personality that's well suited to being a commercial artist or an artist that works, you know, in collaboration with, with companies and people. Well, I think, you know, we talked about reverence on the phone and the idea that we have to have reverence for people that come to us, you know. Um, I, I never adopt um, an, a my way or the highway sort of approach to anything because I understand that there are a lot of decisions that were made specifically in advertising. You know, there may have been six months of conversation, many, many, many things shot down, many things approved, many people involved. And that entire six months and all the effort comes down to me on the day making the picture that they've been talking about for six months or whatever. So I am absolutely interested in collaborating and to try to achieve you know, what they need, right? And still make it mine. And I think at this point in my career, I get hired to do the kind of images that I like to make. So it's not usually a struggle to achieve that. But I really, I have to con always consider that and always consider and always have gratitude for, you know, even getting the phone call. Um, so I think personality-wise, there's a great quote by Jay Mizell, who's a wonderful, wonderful photographer and a wonderful person. I mean, he said, uh, if you want to become a better photographer, become a more interesting person. And I think there's so much truth to that because, you know, as visual artists, you know, if we're culling our inspiration from our discipline, I feel like we need to go out outside of our discipline. And I feel like life is our first sort of venue, right, or avenue for inspiration. And, you know, other visual arts and other arts and medicine and wherever we want to go to bring stuff back into our work. One of the things that I've always actually sort of struggled with when I've, when I've tried to kind of conceptualize what a, a photographer career even looks like mm -hmm. is how, how you differentiate yourselves from other photographers. Um, because, like you said, you are using a lot of the same tools and a lot mm -hmm. of the same tricks. Is it really just your process and use of those tools that sets you apart? Is there something else? Is it is it really like what you just said? The the life experience is that really? Well, I think a sensibility that you just that you develop, right? So you, you develop a sensibility. So in photography, obviously, the sensibility is steeped in what's available equipment-wise and what's available from a technical standpoint, and then also sort of what's my voice, you know? Right. And that applies to anything, you know? What's your voice? I mean, yeah. if you think about, I was just working with. Uh, with uh, uh, astrophysicist um, Kip Thorne, who I showed earlier in the in the uh, uh, slideshow, and we were talking about you know quantum mechanics, quasi quantum physics. We went for a hike, 
and we talked about music, and we talked about you know the few notes and chords that you have that you can use to make music, and uh, I said, I wonder at what point like society will run out of options, <laughs> and he, using mathematical formula, said very, 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 very long time. Because mathematically, you can calculate like the infinite possibilities of it, you know, even with the small numbers that you have to work yeah. with. So, which I found uh, I found really comforting actually. But uh, but I think it just in terms of uh, in terms of like setting yourself apart, you know, I really feel like you know there's a there's a sort of we, oftentimes we hear the word we hear the word style, and style to me to a degree is more artifice, it's more surface, right? It's more like recognizable quickly and content maybe is a secondary thing. So you thumb through a magazine and you see an illustration by Marshall Erisman, for example, in the 80s or 90s, right? And you love that thing and you know who did it. And it almost doesn't matter initially sort of what it's about or what it is. You know, it's a beautiful object, right? And it's and his work was very consistent. So it was always in Marshall Erisman illustration, which I absolutely loved. And Brad Holland, if you think about Matt Mahern's work. But there's a depth to those individuals as well that is beyond sort of like what you would call the style or the approach, et cetera. And I think that depth of in the insight and the depth that is imbued within the illustration is what makes it desirable, as well as the aesthetics of it, you know, but the ability to, to sort of fuse complex thoughts into something that's invariably like very simple or can be very simple. Um, but that's the age old thing, like, you know, what's anybody's style? Like, what's Ansel Adams' style? You know, it's like he's shooting Yosemite, right? But there's a reverence for the place that, you know, really manifests itself in the image. And also there's a, a, a way of working, technical way of working, and then compositional and, cons you know, I look at works from like Ray Metzger, for example, who passed away a couple weeks ago. And I have no idea where that came from when I look at that work. It's so profoundly complex and go beautiful and graphic at the same time, heartfelt and soulful. You know, I look at that stuff and it's almost a mystery to me, you know, where that came from. You know, you look at work and you think like, wow, I gotta hang it up, I'm gonna sell my cameras. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. that's Every one day. of them, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Can, can we talk quickly about these? Because the, the process is, is completely different than... than yeah, these are the photogram, ones. these are photograms that, um, initially photograms and then, uh, so basically a sheet of photographic paper put into an easel under in a larger exposed to light and then soaked in water and then squeegeed off and then hand applying chemicals <clears throat> to, uh, to the paper and making paintings um, uh, uh, using chemicals and silver and then fixing it as though you would a normal photograph. So these I did a couple weeks ago actually and then the early ones were made years ago. Those were made quite a long time ago. Um, and it's interesting as well, ways of working, when we talk about ways of working. So the idea is you know, you'll explore something and oftentimes I'll get I won't get uh, uh, disillusioned by it, but maybe I feel like I come to a point where I want to move into something else. But you always have that sort of body of work. You know, I think of my work as, uh, you know, I, I see when I'm shooting, if I'm out on, on the street with my Roloflex doing like street photography, I know where that work goes within my body of work. You know, okay, that's gonna go over here. That's part of this body of work. That's part of so that So you're body editing of work. sort of as you're even observing. As you're doing like it. So I'm right now I'm shooting for this body of work or whatever. So, you know, these are, these chemical paintings are, you know, a part of sort of a big body of work of that type of work, photographs, chemical paintings, et cetera. These are Xeroxes. I'm obsessed with Xeroxes. I know all the people at my Kinko's first name basis. <laughs> There's these identical twins that work there. Amazing, these two guys. Can you tell I can them never apart? tell. It's awesome when they're both working, but I can never tell which one's working at any given time. But, you know, this is a cactus, uh, cactus branch, and this is a... Uh, this is, I, I made this grid and I put it on the uh, on one of my drills and I took the drill to Kingo's and sat the grid onto the thing and then hit the button and fired up the drill. So it spun as it scanned, <laughs> it was scanned over it. And you know, the great thing about doing that and the photograms on, honestly is there's a, a very rapid feedback. You're getting the feedback right there, yeah. you know, so you're saying, you know, you're you're seeing the results of it instantly. And the Xerox stuff, especially, is just so much fun to do. That's the last image I have, but we can keep talking. Yeah, well, I think we're actually almost out of time. I have okay. one qu quick question, uh, a two-parter, which I think you answered the first part already about uh, staying relevant. It uh -huh. sounds like uh, it sounds like that has not been a problem. But my my main question, the one that I was sort of the most curious about, is how you've maintained interest in your career for you said 30 years you've mm -hmm. been you've been working. Mm -hmm. um, were there ever moments of burnout, of fatigue with with what it is you were doing? 
There, there have been moments of fatigue, obviously. I mean, when I think about the logistics of getting to the point where I'm photographing, so the amount of time that's invested in a two-hour shoot, you know, flying to Europe to do a shoot, you days and days and days, and you're actually exercising your abilities for a very short period of time, two hours, an hour, whatever it is, th several hours, um, those can get very tiring because you're not actively like making your art, you know, it's about the logistics become a, a more a part of it. But I would say the only burnout I've ever had has just been physical burnout where I can't, you know, I need to stop, I need to rest, you know, I keep going. But as far as, you know, discipline goes constantly, obsessively, shoot every day, you know, just I was shooting yesterday, walking around the streets and shooting and I feel like, you know, the my camera that I carry in my pocket that has a phone attached to it, you know, those, yeah, those things. Those, yeah. I am so over this thing of like, I shot it on my cell phone. It's like the ability for that phone, for that camera on that phone is far, far greater than the cameras that my parents grew up photographing me with, like a 110 and those 127s and all those. And I feel like people really marginalize it because it's shot on the phone. And I also wanted to address the hipstamatic filter thing, which to <laughs> me is called like the Super 8 effect. Like you point a Super 8 camera at anything and it looks totally badass. It doesn't make anybody a good photographer. What it does is it takes the image out of the realm of reality and it creates a lure. So we're like compelled to look at it because it's something we can only experience through the photographic process. I told a friend of mine the other day I was going to tape an old phone to my Leica uh -huh. so that when I went out, you know, I had a I had a camera phone rather than a phone camera or whatever, phone camera. I don't know. Anyway, um, so what was the question again? Uh, <laughs> staying interested. I think that I think you answered it. Yeah, staying interested. Yeah. Is, that's never been a problem for me at all. And if it's not, you know, I, I, I do this weird like obsessive stuff too, like all, you know, I got obsessed with like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and like watched every movie and read every book and figured out like all these sort of trivia around it. And then I'll get into this and I'll get, you know, I'm way into model trains. I have a whole train layout up in my studio. And now all I do is watch obsessively uh, European speedway motorcycle racing, like <laughs> as a way to relax. But I go through these major sort of like, I want to learn everything I can about this thing. Yeah, are those, are, would, you, would you classify those as hobbies or are they filtering back into the creative work somehow? Definitely. It, it's just an extension, yeah. I think. Yeah. I mean, you know, I find sort of the train thing when I watch my train, I can sit and watch my trains go around their tracks and there's a real meditative feeling to that. And then also there's the satisfying boyhood you know, I, like I've consciously bought like exactly the trains with the proper dates and every single thing that I would have seen when I was a kid. So like perfectly matched to like what yeah. it should be and stuff like that. So I don't know what that is, but I do feel like all that behavior, <laughs> what brings, is that? it all brings it back in. Yeah. I, I feel like it brings it yeah. back in, you know. Uh, no, I, I, I don't, it, they just come to me. I mean, you know, the hobby of like, getting up early in the morning and watching a live feed of a Grand Prix Speedway race in Poland is could I could have never told you that I was going to be doing that. So I'm sure something will present itself. The season just ended. Uh, an American actually won uh, the gold. Greg Hancock, he's 44. He's from... <laughs> My wife's like, okay, that's enough. She's so sick of the Speedway thing. It's not even funny. Anyway. Yeah, I don't feel like I've conquered any of them, but I do feel like I've made strides, right? Because I, mean, I don't think we ever conquer. I think we, we do, we can get a, 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 a sort of a modicum of command over it, right? Um, you know, I've been playing around with painting for a long time and never have had the time nor the sort of instruction to, I'm kind of figuring it out, which I think one mysterious part of any career also is the idea that you need to know what it needs to look like and I really do feel like we invent the way we do everything so like early on it's like what is it be what does a photographer wear what is it for you know you try to think of like what is that you know and the truth is at the end of the day you just kind of make it up for yourself I think not to say we can't learn from other people's experiences etc you know uh it's you know I've shot on in New York since I lived here in uh, 1987 I moved here and, uh, you know, I'm a real traditionalist, so I grew up kind of, you know, with the appreciation of uh, going way back, you know, lighter in the 50s and, Cal you know, Callahan not so much in New York, but in Chicago and Metzger, like I said. And then, you know, into the 70s with Meyerowitz and Papa George and uh, McDonough and 
a lot of that sort of really traditional street photography. That's kind of, you know, I say, when you say street photography, I feel like oftentimes people think of like Paris and New York. Those are kind of the meccas for the street photography thing. So there's a lot of different ways I work. You know, I'll work 35 loose and just look for stuff. Um, and then I'll work medium format and stuff is more stayed and more kind of observed and looked at. But it's just black and white 35 and medium format. Um, uh, handheld stuff, just, you know, portraits, street portraits, also just like great moments, details, et cetera, et cetera. On the topic of New York, I had a quick follow-up question. Mm -hmm. um, what was it that uh, inspired you to leave the city in the first place? Oh, well, I, I, uh, I grew up in California, and uh, I was living in New York, and all along I thought, you know, I'd like to go back to California. My family's all there, et cetera. And I met my uh, beautiful wife here, who's chiding me about Speedway earlier, and she, uh, she and I met, and we were bi-coastal for a little while. She was living in Hollywood. She was working in the film business, and uh, then kind of made the plunge and went back to New York. So it was kind of a non-event. I thought it might have been sort of a seminal event in that, you know, I thought my career might change, and I really was, I had anxiety to a degree about, like, moving away from where all the publishing is, but it was, it was not, not an event at all. I feel like if I'd moved to a smaller market, like Austin's a very small market. It's saturated with photographers. Um, at that point, that might have been a problem. Yeah. But moving to LA, there's a lot of work in LA. Sure. And, stuff. and nowadays, I guess it doesn't even really matter, right? The the, the internet and, and all that. Yeah, it so it, it doesn't really. Yeah, it doesn't really. I think the tools um, and the approaches will change, but I think, like for example, in the illustration work, you know, I don't think I'm even remotely like in the f high field of illustration, like even remotely. And I can't do what Sam can do. There's no way in hell I could do that. But I can do what I can do. And I can take my skills, whatever level my skills are that exist, and I can kind of make images that are, I don't want to say subservient, but sort of are reflective of what my skill set is. And so if I get an assignment to do some, say it's a collage or a drawing or whatever, you know, I can work the way I've kind of established. And I've done it for a long time. I've drawn for a long time. I've done all kinds of artworks on paper for a long time, photography on a long time. So I sort of have an idea in my mind of, you know, what I'm doing and how I'm thinking about things. I think what it comes down to is just, you know, understanding how you think about things. And once that happens, then you can start sort of like, that'll manifest in the work. Sam and Dan, I'm afraid we have to leave it here. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's really, really a thrill having you.